Rocío, would you like to clarify something you said? Yeah, please accept my apologies. I am so tired and forgetful that I made a mistake. A small, big mistake, and a colleague of mine told me in the bibliography and the Soviet archive, it's Bofarul, no Boraful. I made a mistake and I put these two things together. So if you took photos or copied the name, please accept my apologies. I have read this book like 300 times, but Welling is also, you know, to put the blame on for this because I was, I'm so tired. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. First and foremost, I would like to say thanks to the four panelists because they did a wonderful presentations. I love them all. And I have a question for Professor Velasco. With regards to the participation of Arabs in international brigades, it has the silence been done in purpose or is it because I lack of knowledge that I don't know it? Because this morning when I saw about the participation of Arabs, Arabs, uh, people from Arab origin in the International Brigade, I had no idea. I didn't know that they participated. So was it was this oblivion made in purpose or not? Whether it's been in purpose or not, I don't know. We should ask those who ha kept it silent. But it's true that this is just an emerging topic of study. In 1984, there was this PhD, uh, and the first Monsalen um, work is from the 1980s, but it's still um, starting out. There's no school, there's, there are no, you know, there's no continuity in many of these studies and in some of these countries. The current situation doesn't allow scholarship, uh, you know, scholars to do what they should sometimes, but no, in November last year, I was at the Arab Hispanic experts in, you know, and, and at, in that conference, there were very interesting studies on Spanish in the concentration camps during the Civil War and the Second World War, and the Arabs that could have participated in the Spanish Civil War and the Second World War. This is the first steps. We're just facing the early steps of the Arab history in the Spanish conflict. But well, whether it was done in purpose or not, our world is so fast, so quick. Uh, we have, you know, fast food, fast media sometimes, fast news, and it's much easier and simple to reinforce our own identity through, you know, this division between us and them, and by homo, uh, make having a homogeneous side versus another, we, con we don't speak about all the non-religious uh, Arab world and the amount of prisoners. It's much more convenient to um, show the Arab world as a single image where the Islam is at the core and everyone is Muslim without challenging some, you know, other ideas as the activism of some Arabs. I'm not saying that it's intentional, but I'm saying that this happens with many more news. Latin America, for example, um, there's also a terrible treatment. Um, so it's this quick consumption speech, right? where things have to be, you know, simplified. And of course, there is uh, Islamophobia, there are some biases, and so on. I would like to ask Professor de Rouen how we should treat volunteers, Spanish volunteers against fascism, like my dad, because um, the brigades were against fascism, but this link, there must be a link. Um, uniting them all, that is to say, the fighters against fascism in Spain are, you know, the same as the international brigades. So how should we call them? Volunteers against fascism or international brigades? Or do they belong to a wider concept, which is anti-fascist, anti 
um, volunteers. Could you clarify this? How should they, we call them? I don't know. Because, I mean, the question is how we call brigaders, Spanish, um, or Spanish people within the brigades? What do you mean exactly? I haven't understood your question. There are volunteers against fascism that did not belong to the international brigades, but he was a volunteer. Some were volunteers, some were not. But I don't know, that depends. Those are historians who should say, but to me they're just Republican, loyal troops, maybe volunteers, maybe not. Some of them joined voluntarily, and even some joined the brigades. I have some cases of Spaniards in the brigades. But the, in the brigades, they were brigaders. But how are Spaniards called? After the campaign, when there are no more volunteers, how do we call the Spaniards and Catalans at the end of the Ebro War who end up in the brigade units, like the man we had this morning in the morning session? So Spaniards are just loyal militians at the beginning, then Republican loyal soldiers. And then anti-fascist activists or communists or socialists or whatever. Of course, we could have a discussion on the fact that brigaders, in their brigader ID, when they came to Spain, they had to write down that they were anti-fascist. They couldn't say communist or socialist. They had to write down anti-fascist because in that way, they were highlighting the fact that fighting against fascism was the key. And at the beginning, they did not he, they, they did not show how many communists there were. So anti-fascism can be used in different scenarios. A question for uh, Dr. Robert Cole. Cole. In the Lincoln Brigade, there were white race and black race brigaders. And there was a commander, Oliver Lowe, who was black, a black man, a black civilian. I would, did the racial problems that we suffered in America at the time, did they happen in the brigades or not? Or did they coexist regardless of race with, without any problems? Looking at the history of the American participation in the Spanish Civil War in the brigade, the first military unit formed by Americans was composed by white and men, white and black alike, in the Lincoln Brigade. But then the first North America, Afro-American North American to be leading um, was Oliver Law, who was bold in the Brunette battle, who was dead in the Brunette battle. So the Communist Party policy in the States, even before the Civil War, was integration and equality among races. And the policy that they implemented at the brigades was exactly the same as the Communist Party in the United States. And this is why we have both races, but brigaders continued in the 1960s. They were in the first line to in the fight for racial integration and to avoid segregation in the South, especially. So we have some testimonials from Afro-American brigaders in the American battalion, and they say that in Spain, it was the only moment of their lives when they felt like a full man and nobody would disrespect them or treat them as an inferior being because of the race. Of course, there are some anecdotes that I could quote. In another conference in Paris, Council Carter, I mentioned his story. He was an Afro-American who worked as a technician in surgical teams in the Medical Medical Bureau. And there was another volunteer who came from Peru, and he worked with Moses Boji. You, you asked about Trueta before, didn't you? Um, 
Well, he had a relative who was a surgeon in the brigade, and his son-in-law, and at the team there was this man from Peru, and he said that when they went to the little town, Spaniards were surprised by the skin color of the black volunteer, because why he was not uh, washing himself to so often. They were just not used to seeing black people. As for racism, there's a story of a doctor, a volunteer doctor in the American Medical Service, a service that was organized by Dr. Barsky. And this doctor came from the south of United States, the United States. And apparently, there's a discussion on whether this happened or not. But the doctor did not want to be on the same table in the board that would take them to France and then to Spain with a black nurse, right? So volunteers against fascism, like this rejection of salaria, well, the political views of the brigaders, the American brigaders, 70% would come from the Communist Party, while in the medical service, nurses, only 25% of nurses were communists before getting to Spain. So there was less activism among doctors, but apparently there was a case of racism uh, within the medical services, but only one case, only one, uh, in as far as I know. But these 80, 120 Afro-American members of the Lincoln Battalion, they were work, working, most of them as a, doing mechanical tasks. And there's a documentary film, I don't know if you saw it, Invisible Heroes, on the participation of Afro-American in the Lincoln um, Brigade. But in reality, you know, when we talk about anti-fascism in Spain, there are two types of it. The anti-fascism by anti-fascists, not only communists, and I don't refer to the official discourse like in the States, for example. Uh, for example, the guy who helped the most was Dubinsky, the chief of the uh, workers' union for women. It was a very anti-communist and strong um, institution. And also in, France, in France, the leader of the CGT fighting against communists. And he helped indeed an awful lot Spain. So this is a more important movement. And of course, amongst communists, there were, there were anti, anti-fascists communists. But the other side, the other type of anti-fascism, it's only a word for the common turn propaganda. It's not a coincidence that only anti-fascism anti is the word. I believe it was you who mentioned the lists that we found in Moscow. So there is the official discourse, which is not really political, because there are women who have come to Spain because they love liberties and anti-fascists, of course. But on the other side, there's a very precise uh, signaling or identification of people. But I would like to add a nuance, and it's killings. No, sorry, I believe that one of the reasons at the end of the Spanish Civil War is the fact that communists listed people, I'm talking about the French case, not the Germans, that's a special case. And it's the fact that we can see anarchists and a good soldier, for example. Of course, he's not an anarchist. It only means that he is a man who says what he thinks. 
But I believe it's interesting that if we write down a document on this individual being an anarchist and good soldier, before the German-Soviet agreement, i.e. in Spain, I believe the community or the Comintern and the political, the communist parties knew that there was going to be another struggle. And for this one, not only communists were going to be needed. And this is a very important point. And I will finish with this idea. All the time, we talk about the international brigaders' retirement, uh, sorry, um, leaving Spain is a treason by Stalin. It, this is not true. It's survivors. We need to rescue survivors because they are these survivors, after all the, the ones being killed in Spain, because we might need them for future battles. This is uh, not univocus. There is a common moment. It's the Soviet-German agreement where all this has been forgotten about. But this link between these two struggles is uh, established. So, it's difficult when it comes to vocabulary issues, but also we need to pay attention to all these different nuances. Let's be aware. Just a little sentence uh, to add an idea about the dossiers of the Moscow archives. I remember one brigadier I met in 1930, it said he's not very politicized, even sort of uh, infantile. Even this person uh, stayed as the Communist Party member until 1995. So, well, he was not really a little bit uh, politicized. So in the, in the US case, this had been done, uh, these uh, subjective ideas had been done by two US members of the party. So many different nuances could be there, not even the strictly political criteria.